Shanghai GDG is a very interesting uh, developer community. I'm glad somebody has asked this question. I mean, this is where the magic happens. This is primarily a question and answer show. So if any of you out there would like to ask questions. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's session of the Google Plus Platform Office Hours. Oops. I have accidentally had my sound on. Oops. Thanks. Sorry about that. Welcome to the Google Plus Platform Office Hours. This is the show um, where we keep you up to date with what's new on the Google Plus platform. This week, we're going to be talking about the new release of the Hangouts API, version 1.2. Um, but before we get into that, let me introduce myself and my co-hosts and those, of those developers who have joined us. So I'm Jennifer Murphy. I'm a developer programs engineer here at Google. I focus on Google Plus, uh, and I help you build awesome stuff with our APIs and plugins. And joining me in studio today, our Hangout expert, Jonathan Barry. I'm a developer advocate working on Google+. I spend a lot of my time uh, building Hangout apps and, and doing video conferencing, uh, fun stuff. And uh, I worked a little bit on this, on this release. Great. And joining us through the magic of cyberspace on the Hangout, from left to right, um, we have Alan. And I think you might be muted. Oh. I'm an outside developer, and I do most of my work with the Hangout API. Great. Gerwin. Hi, I'm Gerwin from Austria. I'm a yeah, developer doing all sorts of stuff with different Google Plus APIs. Thanks. And Moritz. Hi, uh, I'm Moritz from Germany, and I'm a system engineer, and I work mostly with the Hangouts API, the Google Plus API, and some other cool APIs from Google to build awesome apps. Thanks for joining us, guys. Um, and so I guess we'll get right into it. So Jonathan, what's new in the version 1.2 release of the Hangouts API? So 1.2 uh, is our latest release. And we've been iterating on some of the namespaces that we launched in the beginning. Uh, but sort of rounding it out, we, we added a few general API features. Some are interesting if you have particular use cases, but some are just we felt like we needed to add them. Things like uh, the topic, so get to topic, uh, on topic change kind of stuff. Uh, locale information, if the Hangout has a particular preferred language of, for the speakers. Uh, things around the, the YouTube um, live streams to get the YouTube live. Um, but the, the sort of the bigger releases are new types of sound effects. So previously, we allowed you to broadcast locally. So I, I could hear, let's say it's my turn, like a ding, for example. But uh, in the newest release, we've added the ability to broadcast sound. So everybody can hear that same, that same track, whether it be um, background music playing in a game uh, or, or like a laugh track. And it's all synchronized, and, it's, and it uses the same noise canceling um, capabilities of the plugin, and you just have to pass that URL in it, in it place. Cool. We've, we've also released another interesting API um, related to an app we, we produce called Cameraman. And so we've provided the ability for uh, broadcast applications to remove particular users from the broadcast. That sounds really useful for larger broadcasts. Mm -hmm. But by far, the, the I think the most requested feature that we made into 1.2 is our memory management capabilities. So this is the ability to uh, load resources to the plugin, whether they be static overlays or, or um, face tracking overlays, and really know when they're loaded, uh, to dispose of them when you don't need them, to, to track when it's actually been disposed and events around that stuff. So I'd like to spend a few minutes in just talking about those particular features in a little bit more depth and general best practices for memory management. Sounds great. Tell us more. Yeah, so uh, before 1.2, you could create a new uh, resource. And that could be an image resource, that could be an audio resource, and you just kept on creating them as you needed them. There was actually no way to dispose of those resources. So the, the challenge was every time you create a new resource, you take up memory, and the plugin runs the, whether it be an image or an audio snippet, uh, in the memory of the browser and in your system, and it varies across different capabilities of systems. So if high-end machines would have lots of memory to play around with, and lower-end machines would you know, just bork out. So of course, we want to address that, that problem by adding the ability to not only track when resources are loaded, but to figure out the state of all the resources and dispose of them. So that same face tracking or static overlay or even um, audio resource, you can, you can properly manage them. 
Uh, and that really helps you if you're trying to be nice to your users' computers or if you're trying to use those resources for more computationally intensive things. And uh, it's, it's pretty neat. It, it, if you go to the documentation, uh, I'm not going to actually pull up or walk through the particular examples. But on the actual objects you create, uh, you can go ahead and call a method called dispose, and that will get rid of it. Um, you can also check if it's loaded by calling is loaded method, uh, method or is dispose method. And there's a bunch of events associated with the different types of, uh, of objects to tell when it's loaded. So you can track that. And uh, you can go ahead and sort of walk through all your different, different objects, or your resources in this case, and dispose of them or, or work with them. Very cool. So it sounds like it opens up potential for new applications? Yeah, definitely. Um, we, so we have a set of running sample apps. And uh, our, our go-to sample app is the Media Starter. And that plays around with the different use cases for overlays. Uh, one example that we added uh, recently was the ability to do, we're calling it an animated overlay. But really, it's, it has a little counter uh, with a clock that changes from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3. And that does that efficiently by um, disposing of it when it's not necessary and also playing around with the different URLs. Very cool. Sounds like a, a lot of potential for some pretty cool overlay applications. So. I look forward to seeing what people develop. Yeah, and it just goes in line with the larger topic of memory management. As, as front-end engineers, we tend not to worry about memory management the same way that other types of engineers. So if you've come from an embedded system background or, or building you know, console games, you very much know that memory is really important. But in the client-side world, we tend not to build really resource-intensive games or applications unless you're really in the game space. But when you're doing things with Hangouts, you are starting to create resource constraints. So taking advantage of the ability to dispose of resources or smartly reusing those is, is best practices. But also things like taking advantage of request to animate frame, which is a feature of the browser, to smartly um, change your frame rate, and tab visibility, which lets you know if, if a user is using your, currently focused on your application, and things like web workers and smart caching, things like that. Very cool. Yeah. Excellent. So thanks for that summary of what's, what's new in Hangouts 1.2. You're welcome. So as, as I said during the pre-roll, this is a questions and answers show. Does anyone from the Hangout have any questions about things we added in the version 1.2 API or anything else about Hangout app development? Yeah, I had a question that was actually a, a follow-up a little bit on the, the memory resource issues that we just discussed. One of the things that, um, that people have noticed is that once you have an image resource, you can create a single overlay from that. But trying to create a second overlay or trying to create another image resource using the same URL doesn't work as well as you might expect. Is that still an issue with 1.2? There was a thread actually with Moritz regarding that. Uh, it sounded like there was a bug with using the same URL. Um, but yeah. not, but yes. not, but not, uh, not creating new resources. So in, in general, go ahead and intelligently create a new resource when you want to have a new image. Uh, but for example, in, in the lower thirds use case, you really only have one image resource. So you want to swap out the URL if it changes. Uh, and and, and that, that bug is filed, and that, that particular one is being worked on. And I, and I don't think there should be any issues with creating new image resources. OK, I, I think this actually came up with one of the um one of the, the, the donut tossing game, yeah. where they wanted to have multiple donuts, which were the same image resource, mm -hmm. but multiple overlays from that. And their workaround at the time was actually to create multiple image resources. Yep. yep. OK, so that's still, still in place. That, yeah. that, that, that constraint is still there. Yeah, and, and that, that's actually a bug. And that's being worked okay. on um, as we speak. It's already been filed and uh, um, identified. Uh, but creating new resources, and just in general, shouldn't, shouldn't be any problem. Uh, okay. if, you, if you look at uh, some of the, just the effects app, for example, we're using multiple overlays on, and with face tracking overlays. So there's you know, three to four overlays at one time. That's, that's, that's no problem there. Cool. Yeah, I just want to jump in right there. Um, as, as Gervin mentioned, this still a bug with the same image resource when the URL is the same. Um, I noticed that a while ago. It was working fine um, in version 1.1, but at some point, something changed in the Hangout code, which is causing um, this issue, this behavior of the URL. So whenever I have a lower third up 
and disable it without changing anything and want to load it up again, it's not showing up. Um, but now with version 1.2 and with the dispose um, method, um, I can handle these images in my app. So whenever I disable an overlay, I dispose it at the same time. But as you said, if you want to load up the same URL, so more than one object, um, like cloning them, it's not working at the moment. Right. Uh, but if you dispose any resources and you know handle the resources properly with the new methods, it's working fine. Great. Yeah, that's a great workaround. And like I said, uh, it, it may be in the plugin level. So that that's that's something that changed over time. Uh, that we re basically may have reintroduced that uh, that minor bug. Uh, but it, it's it's an easy fix, and we we've identified it. So that shouldn't be a problem. And yeah. Another workaround. Um, sorry. I'll go for um, it. Another workaround um, I figured so far is to just add a transparent pixel somewhere in the image and change the alpha mm -hmm. channel. Um, always in one step. Um, so the, the URL, the, the data URL is always di a bit different, but you don't actually see it in the actual image. So it's some sort of tricky workaround um, until it gets fixed, and this works as well. Yeah, and I, I think one of the other solutions that we talked about um, was if you know the image is not changing, you may not need to dispose of it. You may just want to um, hide it. Uh, and then and re enable it at a future time. And if there is a change to the resource, you may want to use things like fragment identifiers to change the URL, cache busting uh, style. But of course, there's still the, the bug that we, we're going we're gonna to plug as well. But that may come in, in handy for other, other instances when you want to have the same base image resource and, and do things like data URIs um, to, to dynamically change that content. Great. So if you are watching the stream live, either on YouTube or on Google Plus Developers, just wanted to remind you that you are welcome to ask questions either by posting on the event as a comment or by commenting on the YouTube channel. I'm, I'm watching the comments right here. So feel free to ask questions. So does anyone in the Hangout have any other questions about the API before we move on to the questions from the comments? Uh, Gurin, I, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, I saw a comment about um, the YouTube Live ID uh, that you've integrated in one of your applications. No, not yet. I'm planning to. Oh, do, oh. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm planning to use it for the comment tracker because then people can just start up the comment tracker and I can automatically fetch all the YouTube comments without people having to copy the URL and putting it in. So. Just to make it easier for people to use common trackers so they don't have to copy a URL from here, from there. They just yeah, take it and put it on, put it in. Uh, so they just start the common tracker and will fetch the YouTube IT automatically and fetch all the comments. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of glazed over the, that minor um, feature, the basic again, the YouTube Live of the Hangouts on Air. That's, that's, that's a perfect use case of that functionality. Because right now, uh, the, the broadcaster of the Hangout does have the embed code, for example, for the YouTube, but can interact with it. So there's a lot of interesting use cases of how you could use the YouTube um, URL right in your application for broadcast uh, purposes, um, sharing, and things like that. Cool. It seems like it'll make a lot of things easier. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Jonathan, so. can, you men uh, can you just mention briefly, is the data that is returned by that the ID of the, the YouTube video, or is it a URL? For one of the one of the various ways to get to that video, uh, it is the YouTube ID, and so you can essentially generate the, the YouTube URL by appending the ID to the YouTube.com. And yeah, I, so I actually wanted to ask about because you have this on YouTube ID ready event, mm -hmm. will this fire in any case, or will it? So if I already have the Hangout on air running and I start the application later, will the event still fire because then the ID was already ready? Do we need to check this, or will the event fire in any case? That's a good question. Uh, I haven't tested for that, but that's certainly something I could figure out for you. Yeah, that's probably something I'm going to test anyway. <laughs> OK. Uh, we'll do that in conjunction. I'll let you know. Yeah, there, there's, there are some cases where uh, the events will fire only in only one rare situation, uh, but it's still useful. So for example, um, on you know, some of the Hangouts uh, on-air stuff will only fire in one particular path. So uh, we still provide those because that what one use case is, is useful for, since so the apps we're building or apps that um, we foresee. 
Well, for an on-ready, I'd expect it to probably work um, for when participants join. So give it a try and tell us how well it works. Can always, uh, if it's un if the, the current behavior is not what you expect, we can always take another look at it. Okay, I have um, not really two questions, but more like feature requests or suggestions. Uh -huh. um, one feedback. thing I already talked about with Jenny, um, it would be cool to be able to figure with the API if the Hangout is set to plus 18 or not, mm. because um, I'm working on a game currently, um, which might contain some swear words in one edition. Sure. So we want to build like two editions, one which is PG-13 and one which is 18 plus. But this requires me to have some tools in the API where I can figure out the state of the Hangout. Like, is it public or not, or is it 18 plus or not? And um, the other thing is, um, especially, I think, for all developers who develop apps. Um, I'm, I haven't tried it yet, but it, would it work when I add a plus one button to my app, or like the share button, would it actually share the app? Am I able to put specific URL stuff in there, including the app ID, so they can launch the app from the shared post? Or is that something you could probably think of building into the API, like having a share option for apps? I can answer that one. So yes, you can render share buttons, plus one buttons, badges, and all of those plugins within a Hangout. And you can specify target URLs. So you can render a plus one button, and you can target whatever you like. You could target the um, a URL to start the Hangout, for example. But um, if you're going to be changing the target often during the runtime of uh, your Hangout, potentially um, if you're targeting like a high score or some other content like that, the share link might actually be the most appropriate because it's the most lightweight mechanism of sharing to Google Plus. Yeah, I was actually sharing really the app. Like when a user opens up the app and thinks, "Wow, this is a great app. I want to share that with my friends." Actually, they have to figure out the app or find an app page to this app. But when they have a share button, they can instantly click it and it will post to the Google Plus stream, and they can let other users know about this app. So I've actually done some experiments with this. Uh, I have an, a sample app I should probably publish, but it's the code is really simple because all the plugins have an explicit render mode. So that's what I was. I, you can use that to say I want to render this plugin right now. And of course, the share link is is a great option. Uh, and we also have the Hangout URL. So with the Hangout URL, that's one way to pass it. I know the um, some of the Hangout apps now, like the Poker, for example, they pull in the Hangout URL and they they post that to their site. And that's one way of doing it to share it. Um, and the other one is to create a, 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 a Hangout with a GID on it as well, right? Um, and it works. There's no there's no real. It's ex works exactly as documented. There's like nothing tricky there. Um, but one thing I also want to throw in there is brands really like to use both the share link and the badge inside their Hangout. So as you can imagine if you're a brand and you have a plus page and it's really active. To get the to get users to drive them to your plus page, the 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 badge, as well as share, let's say the page or um, part of the of the app. So it could be a screenshot that you've rendered um, or some sort of state information. Talking oh. about brands, um, when I will it be able for brands to um, launch apps in a Hangout? I hear a lot of brand page users, mm. and they want to use lower third in their brand hangouts, mm -hmm. but they're not able to because the permission thing pops up and then disappears again. Uh, yes. We, we did one small change recently about how uh, apps are, uh, sorry, extensions are being rendered within Hangouts. I, th I think you saw that post. Uh, and and we're, working on, we're working on better integration for the rest of Google Plus like Plus Pages. So that's coming soon. Um, and uh, we know it's, it's a major issue. On the previous topic, I would also add that I've been doing some testing recently using uh, the History API to log when you start an application and have that application automatically show up in your history vault. And that's been working out fairly well so far. Um, still not production yet, but it's it's a good trend. And I see that as a, a really good avenue to start pursuing. That's pretty neat. And actually, I think moments within a Hangout app could be interesting too, not just launch. Definitely. We've gotten a lot of feedback from, from many of you and a lot of other people in the developer community about moment ideas. And a lot of them centered around the kind of experience you would expect within a Hangout app. So. We're listening. Keep the feedback coming. I'll you continue that development for sure. Great. Awesome. So I guess I'm going to take a few questions from the stream. First one is one Alfield. Sean asks, will this Hangout be archived for later viewing? 
And the answer is yes. You will always be able to watch this Hangout from the Google Plus event. Um, we'll embed the video there. And we'll also upload it to YouTube, um, the Google Developers channel. I'll include links to that in the show notes. So yes, you can watch these. They'll be archived. Um, and you can also see all of the previous sessions archived there as well. And Daryl has some questions. So Daryl asks, is there a way for a user to remove a plugin from their Hangout once they have added it? Uh, and so I, th I think what Daryl's asking about uh, for Hangout app extensions, if somebody's uh, ran a Hangout app extension, can they remove it during the session and after the session? And so during the session, you can actually stop running any app by going to the lower app switcher. There's the People tab and the Apps tab. And if you click on that, you'll see the running Hangouts. And as you hover over those apps, there's a little title and an X next to it. And that's, that actually kills the app uh, for your session. And um, you can either run it again if, if something went wrong or if you just don't want any more apps to be running uh, for this Hangout. Uh, in terms of post Hangout, so if you notice at the top of the screen, there's a list of recently used apps. And if you go to Add Apps, there's even a longer one. Uh, that's basically just a running list. It's not installed. It's just been, um, it's been recently run and authorized. Now, if you want to deauthorize that, just like any app you've ever associated with your Google account, you can go to the Google account settings and revoke the, um, that access. Uh, but it will still show up in your recently used list. And that's uh, just sort of a, a UI uh, feature right now and uh, something certainly we can look into. Great. He also he has a couple more questions. So his next question is, the self view of the camera is mirrored, flipped left to right. This also happens when images are displayed with my plugin. Is this a known issue? So that actually was, uh, it's, not, it's not an issue. It's, uh, it's something that we've, uh, we've implemented on purpose. <laughs> and it can be a little confusing. We actually did a bunch of user studies around video, and we found that it's actually awkward for users to see themselves right uh, facing because in, in their day to day lives, they see a, um, the, the only time they see themselves is in a mirror. And when you display themselves uh, right facing, it throws them off. Their depth perception is kind of screwed. Uh, they don't know their right from their left. And, and this was through user testing. And uh, we've, we've, we've enforced that, and uh, it, it seems to be helping a lot with user confusion. Now, when you have an app, that becomes most apparent when you have text, for example, because it looks flipped. When you're just, you know, your face is on camera, it's not a, as big of a deal. Uh, I've seen, uh, you know, even Moritz's app uh, declare, "Hey, you know, don't worry. This is uh, this is a flipped image. This is supposed to happen. It'll look right for you." Uh, and that's just something uh, we have to contend with, uh, being on broadcast and video. Um, yeah. Right, because since we're we're flipping the image of yourself, we also have to flip any overlays you have so that they line up properly with whatever the content on the screen is. Because if we didn't, content on the overlay that would be on the left side would be on the right side, and you'd have a different view than those viewing your stream. So yeah. just a necessary evil, uh, just part of human psychology. So we, we did it on purpose. If you want to try it out the other way, you can always use other webcam applications, and you should try it out sometime if you have the chance. Using um, Photo Booth, you can actually tell it to remove the reverse, and it's, it's a pretty trippy experience. You'll definitely realize why we're doing it if you try that out. Daryl has one more question. I'd love to see the API support multiple cameras on a single machine. Give developers functions to switch between these cameras and maybe grab a, a still from the camera. It would add a lot of functionality. So it sounds like there's three feature requests. One is to support multiple uh, cameras from the plugin. The second one is to expose the ability to switch those plugin, uh, those cameras from the plugin. And the third is a screenshot API. Uh, the, the multiple cameras one, that is an interesting challenge. The way that uh, the Google uh, Talk plugin works is it talks to the operating system sort of um, blindly, saying, hey, I would like a webcam interface to work and do some cool stuff with it. And the uh, operating system is like, hey, here's the webcam. It um, doesn't know too much about the architecture of the, of the webcam. It doesn't know the model. doesn't know the make for sort of the string of for the title to display. And so that's sort of transparent to the plugin as it stands today. For systems that for operating systems that support multiple webcams running at the same time uh, and that they can expose that to the plugin, that's a little bit tricky. 
Uh, d definitely, when you move up to sort of the professional grade video mixing stuff, like the kind of stuff we use to do this, uh, it's, it becomes easier. But for the average consumer, uh, you know, sitting in their house or maybe you know at a, at a party using a, a laptop, that's that's probably not the the most common use case. It's everything interesting, and uh, we we're always exploring different ways we can add new functionality to the plugin beyond just overlays and you know broadcasting, and and. I, I think that's, that it is an interesting use case. I, I don't have anything else to say about that today, uh, just because it is it is a challenge mm -hmm. in many many ways. But uh, the same goes with the API that that would go with that to do camera switching. I, I've definitely seen people experiment with using multiple machines and multiple cameras to do a faux studio like setup. So they actually take an, a, one of the spots in the Hangout and then use a Hangout app to switch who's who's the camera being focused on. So you get that sort of studio effect. Uh, and then the, the screenshot one is a great idea, a uh, great feature request. Um, I definitely hope you can file that into our um, uh, issue tracker, because that's I've, I've heard that before. And if it's not there already, that's a great one to, to bubble up. Yep, I, I believe that one's already being tracked in our issue tracker. So I'll include a link to that issue if you'd like to give some more feedback or start so you get notified when there's an update to that request. So yes, if you have other requests, please definitely add them to our issue tracker. It's the best way for us to hear about the requests. Um, it kind of helps us collaborate and just make sure we don't lose them in the shuffle. So I'll link to the issue tracker in the show notes as well. But thanks a lot for the feedback and questions. We have another question from the stream. Actually, it's more of a request. And I'm about to butcher your first name. Sorry ahead of time. Lasse asks, I have a feature request for the Hangout button. It would be really nice to be able to pre-fill the dialogue with emails so that when the Hangout starts, it's easier for people to invite the people that are maybe connected to them on the site. Uh, so first, I, I think you got that right. He's um, Lasse is one of the developers from Symphonical, ah. um, one of the apps that are um, featured. Uh, so yeah, that is that is a great request. Uh, we've heard others like you know the ability to pre-populate for example, members from your circle or circles. Uh, right now, one of the limitations to that is the Hangout button is not JavaScript-based. Uh, and exposing emails through a URL, there's, there's complicated privacy concerns, both here and um, uh, around the world. But uh, I, I definitely think we want to make that button better. Um, it is a, is a cool feature of Hangouts, the ability to launch a new Hangout, the ability to launch a new Hangout with an app running, and the ability to launch a new Hangout with an app running and pre-populate data. So I think that's a natural evolution of where we want to go, is make that button smarter. And um, you know, stay tuned for that kind of development. Yep. It's definitely I, something I think, we're working on. I think as an extension of that, one of the other things that would be great is to have it so that when it, or to have the option so that when it launches, it doesn't bring up the invitation window. Mm -hmm. So that you can launch into a Hangout with the app running and have the app itself do invitation via mm -hmm. other magical means and not feel like you need to invite people in order to um, to run the app. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I like that idea. Yeah, these are both good ideas. And I, I can see them both being useful for different kinds of applications, perhaps. Because some applications may only make sense if there are people there at the very beginning. So a lot of options for us to consider. But yes, mm -hmm. keep that feedback coming. We love it. Great. So are I there? Oh, you beat me to it. I was I about to ask another. if you had. <laughs> I have another small feature request. Um, are you planning at some point maybe to enable the API to expose some data from the Hangout to external websites, for example? Mm. So if, the, I mean, only if the Hangout is public. For a limited Hangout, no go at all. But if you have a public Hangout, it would be cool to have like an API feature which enables me to give a callback to another script or something where I can get like a list of participants who is actually in the Hangout or who was in the Hangout. So especially with Hangouts on Air, when I embed the live player on my own website, and then I want to display as well the participants below the post so people can actually click on the person and mm -hmm. check out their profiles, this would be a great feature. So and you can also like gather a list over time of people who mm -hmm. were in your Hangout shows. So b basically, a rest like either RESTful API or JSONP type of interface right. for metadata around the Hangouts. Uh, right. 
We don't have any plans right now. Uh, I, I definitely heard that from, from you before and from um, Hangout Canopy folks. We're trying to do some interesting things with the RESTful API. Uh, we, we did sort of a lightweight thing with search. Uh, you can sort of trick search to, to find publicly running Hangouts, um, but nothing official in the Hangouts API um, namespace. But definitely, definitely useful, definitely cool. I like that idea a lot. Mm -hmm. And I can, okay, cool. I can think of uh, a bunch of use cases, especially on the on the on air side of why why would you use that. So, right. we'll take that feedback. Yes, making the REST APIs more expressive and more descriptive is something that's definitely on our radar, and we carry a lot we care a lot about. So, no promises yet, but it's something we're definitely thinking about um, in regards to Hangouts, events, and other kinds of rich content that shows up in the in the RESTful APIs today. <laughs> Excellent. So are there any other questions from people in the Hangout? Is there anything on the YouTube channel by any chance? Uh, took a look at it also. I think we're pretty much done for today. Cool. So thanks a lot to all of you who tuned in um, from YouTube Live, from the Google Plus event. And thanks to everyone who joined in the Hangout and in person. So that's it for this week of the Google Plus, this, for this week's session of the Google Plus Platform Office Hours. And we'll be back next week with another Exciting session, I guess. Great. Yep. Bye, everyone. See ya.